Welcome back to On the Edge and Focus. I'm your host, Peter Martinez, with our guest, Pamela Mason Wagner. And in this segment, we're going to show you and tell you about some tips on how to make it in the business. But before that, we're going to talk to Pamela and talk about uh, what's next for you and some projects you're working on now. Well, I'm very happy to be here today uh, because I'm in town and I'm going to speak at the Patrons of the Library lecture series on Sunday about a program I did a year ago called My Brother's Keeper, which is part of a large series of five films about, personal, about ethics in America. And The Brother's Keeper is about personal ethics. That was my hour. And it's always fun to come home and see my family and friends and have a good excuse to do it. But uh, while I'm here, I'm not in New York, uh, where I should be working <laughs> on my current project, which is, uh, the working title is Journey to Justice. It's okay. about a man wrongly accused of a crime he didn't commit and incarcerated for 22 years, finally exonerated through DNA evidence um, with the help of the Innocence Project in New York. Peter Neufeld and Barry Schecht were his attorneys. And it's a very powerful story of a man overcoming the most terrible injustice mm -hmm. that our society could do to someone. And we did film a fair amount of recreation footage. Uh, so we had an actor playing the young Clark, because obviously no footage existed of his ordeals in prison of and course, yeah. before. And we, of course, interviewed the real man and all the people involved in helping to get him out of prison. And that will air on the Discovery Channel sometime later this spring. And it's a pilot for hopefully a series. Well, that's wonderful. Do you find, uh, how much research goes into something to pull off a documentary? How much time, effort, loss of sleep? Mm -hmm. what, what goes into it? Well, in the it? old days, I used to have about a year for, mo for an hour movie, give or take, maybe 11 months. Um, that time frame is being shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. So that was a luxury. That was the luxurious <laughs> time frame, yes. Yeah. Uh, lately, it's, you know, I think I have about 20 weeks on this uh, Innocence Project story. In that case, the Innocence Project did have a lot of research already accumulated mm. because they had gone to trial and defended this guy, so they had a lot of his police records and court documents. Um, but, you know, it takes about a month to do the research for a story before you're actually ready, a month to six weeks, to go out and shoot in the field, whether it's a historical film or a, you know, a verite story. Yeah. Define that for us, just so we, for those who may not know what that term okay. means. Okay. Well, I think of it as an historical film is telling the story of something that happened in the past. So you can't go out and film it today because it's not happening today. So you have to resort to either archival photos, okay. archival footage, or increasingly recreation. Now, recreation is something that used to be frowned upon by strict broadcast news people. I was never one of those people to start mm -hmm. with, so I've never had a problem with it. I think that my job as a person, I film, used some recreation in the Lucy documentary okay. because there were a couple of moments in her story that weren't documented in any way and they were really dramatic highlights that I wanted to talk about. So I felt like I needed to have footage to help tell that story, but I never wanted to show the face because everybody knows who Lucy Ball is, you know, so why would I try to have an actress? Yeah. Now in a situation about, you know, this young man, no one really knows what he looked like when he was 20 years old. I felt I had more leeway to cast an actor and show his face mm -hmm. in trying to tell the backstory of this man's life. Now, verite films are movies where we do the research. For example, the Moyers on Addiction program. I was given the task of making a film about drug treatment. So I went to a lot of different treatment facilities, picked the ones I wanted to film at, decided what stories we wanted to tell, what characters we wanted to focus on, and then we went and filmed it all in the present day and then came back and edited it. So it had no recreation and no archival materials to speak of. A lot of process yeah. that goes into it. Um, technology always plays a role in a filmmaker, documentaries, news. What's your take on some of the latest and greatest things and maybe some inside secrets into uh, how you make your things work? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I think the biggest transition that I see happening in my part of the industry, which really is nonfiction programming for television, is the move to high definition. And I'm waiting to see what that means. Um, on the one hand, I'm always in favor of quality, and I think high def is a high quality format. 
so I'm happy about it. Uh, but I want to see that the budgets are going to reflect the more mm. expensive technology and that we're not going to be asked to make the same film on the same small amount of money, but use more expensive cameras and more expensive technology. So I have my fingers crossed that the move to high def will raise the budget point a little bit. Here at Titan Communications, we have some of the latest cameras from JVC and shooting in high definition. And we always notice the need to have just the, the right lighting and the right uh, focus and all sorts of things. What, what are some other details if a student were to go out and uh, do a film or something? What are, what are some tips that you may give to them to make a successful project? Well, I think high, the reason you're finding that in your experience here with your JVC cameras is that high def is a very unforgiving format, mm -hmm. and it's going to show every flaw and everything you might not want it to show. I think film making is about light. And that's true whether you're shooting on Super 8, 16 millimeter, high def, PD-150s, mini DV, it doesn't really matter. It's all about light. So your challenge is to figure out how to use available existing light in as creative a way as possible, and then when you're using supplemental light, really learning, taking those classes in lighting design to understand how to make the most you know, aesthetically interesting image through your use of light. How proud is your family, do you think, <laughs> of all the work you've done and uh, your mother and your, your husband, your, your, your children? How, well, let's start with the mother. I'm sure she's very proud, as she is, is my here, father. She is here, by the way. You can't see her behind the, uh, the cameras, but she is here. Yes, in and descending order. My parents are very <laughs> proud. My husband, you know, he's my husband, so of course. of course he's proud of what I do, but it's not how he views me. And my daughter could care less <laughs> about what I do. That's not true. I do think <laughs> when she tells her friends she has a dad who's a composer and a mom who's a filmmaker, it's more cool than if she said my parents are accountants. But she's very unimpressed. Oh. <laughs> Um, you will be speaking uh, to the Pollock Library, which is uh, upstairs. We're in the basement, or earth level, as we call it uh, here. But um, what, what do you expect? Generally speaking, it's authors who are invited. And sometimes they talk about the content of their work, and sometimes they talk about the act of being an author. And I think I'm probably going to do a little of both. But I think any time, and I know for myself as, as a viewer, any time I can go to a screening and then the director comes on afterwards and you can hear them talk about the process, it just enhances your appreciation of the film that you just watched. So mm. I think people are always curious about this kind of work. And anything that I can do to demystify it and answer questions and make people see how it works is helpful. Great. Are there any last, how about this? If you knew something, now, but mm -hmm. you didn't know back then, and you wanted to share it with uh, our, our viewers and students, uh, what would it be? If, if you knew something back then that you know now, what, what would it be? I just wish I had, had been pushier, in the sense I was very, um, I felt that I needed to start at the bottom and work my way up, and I was willing to take no for an answer where I think mm -hmm. I shouldn't have. And I've noticed that young people today expect a lot more a lot quicker. And I think in general that's a good thing. I think everybody has to learn, but we don't always learn at the same you know, rate. So I would just encourage people to really get out there and bang on doors, and if this is what you want to do for a living, you can definitely do it, but you just have to show that future employer that you have fire in your belly and you're going to work till you know, all hours of the night to get the job done, which is what it takes. I so much appreciate your time today coming in and uh, sharing your views and your award-winning work very inspiring to me and to everyone who's watching, I, I hope. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for on, having me. On, uh, on the Edge and Focus. So um, good luck to your future endeavors and uh, stay in contact. And, okay, good. And uh, have a great time on, on the uh, lecture series thank in the you. Pollock Library. So that will do it for uh, On the Edge and Focus. And I wanted to uh, thank Titan Communications and all the volunteers and students who have helped make this production happen. We are broadcasting from Cal State Fullerton, and you can watch this channel, Channel 98, Titan TV, or you can visit our website at the address shown here, or visit titancom.fullerton.edu. So for everyone at Titan Communications, I'm Peter Martinez. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.